to True Crime and Cats with me, your gal Phil. I hope you're having a lovely day. Today we are going to get like straight in there and we're going to talk about a serial killer and possible cannibal called Carl Denker. So I'm just going to stick a little disclaimer in before we get on down to it. Today's video is for mature audiences only. It contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes. You clicked on the video, you should know what you're getting yourself into, but if you don't, now you do. I hope you want to stay, but if you don't, then bye, I love you. I hope you have a lovely you know, day and stuff. Now, the reason I say possible cannibal is this man took his victims introduced them into his home, killed them, mostly with a pickaxe, dismembered them, and then turned their body parts into scran, i.e. food, and leather goods. Belts, suspenders, shoelaces, our boy Carl has done it all. He's a crafty man. So we know that he did this, but we don't know that he actually consumed any of it. Did he eat it? We don't know. So there we go, that's that. It ain't right. The reason, despite all of this, that Carl isn't really often mentioned, um, is because it was almost a hundred. It was about a hundred years ago that his murders took place, um, and there just hasn't been that much evidence. Um, most of the evidence was circumstantial, and it was found after the fact, and he was never convicted. So, you know, despite the fact, up to about forty people didn't come out of his house alive. Carl, he was a busy boy. So Carl was born on February the 11th, 1860, in Silesia, a kingdom in Prussia. Oh, and that's now, that's now Poland. Carl Denker was born into a family of relatively well-off farmers. So at the time, farmers were doing okay. So he had an older brother. Um, some sources say his name was Adolf. Um, we don't have a name for his mum or his dad, and not much is mentioned in them. Um, little is known of Denker's childhood, um, apart from the fact that his teachers labelled him an idiot. Poor Carl! Labelled an idiot as a kid. That's a bit harsh. Oh, I need to stop sympathising with serial killers. Although he's, he was a kid, that was when he was a child. I don't sympathise. Anyway. So, he's there at school. Loving in his life, or maybe not. Um, and he doesn't learn to speak or decide to speak until age six. So selective mutism. There are loads of causes for mutism in kids and some of them can be really concerning. You know, abuse and stuff like that. I speculate. Shush, Felicia, stop speculating. So anyway, he runs away age 12. He's like, I'm outie, bye ya, hate you, see you later. And then he comes back and he's like, sorry, that was a bit extravagant of me I'm just I'm just I just don't like you guys very much he finishes primary school he's like I'm done with this bye bye yeah so he becomes the apprentice of a gardener um and that's quite wholesome gardening is wholesome you know I love gardening I'm not very good at it I kill a lot of things but oh my god so did he so did he did naughty he's doing this for a while and then we don't know much of his kind of adolescence and early life and whatever. It's a shame because that would be quite interesting. So we skip to age 25. Carl's father dies. We don't know how. But he dies and he leaves the family home to Carl's older brother Adolf. And he leaves Carl a sum of money. So Carl's like, okay, I'm 25. I've received this portion of money. That's pretty lit. I'm going to go and make myself a life. So he's like, hmm, what shall I do? I'm going to buy a piece of land because, you know, my parents were farmers, so I should be really good at this. So he does so. He buys a piece of land. And he's there sowing his seeds, trying to grow some crops. And I say trying to because he doesn't do very well. In fact, it's a complete and utter flop. Poor Carl, he has to sell it. He's making no money. So he sells the land and he's like, what shall I do? with my money now. So he's like, property. Property's always stable. So stable. <laughs> so he buys a house and he's like, 
yes, I'm a homeowner, I'm in my 20s, I'm loving life. It's on a place called Stawawa Street. Cool. But lest we forget, we're in World War One, So infl- inflation is like on the rise, if you will. So that forces him to sell the house. He has no shmoney. Um, but then he was like, well, you can make me sell it, but you can't make me move out. So he just stays there. <laughs> he sells it, but he stays in like the bottom room. It's just like, cool. So at this point, we don't really know what Carl is doing for money. He hasn't got a house, hasn't got any land. Hmm. What we do know, though, is that he is quite a pious churchgoer. So he is like properly on it with his Christian behaviours. He's loving it. He goes to church all the time, plays the organ, which is interesting because, I mean, you probably have to be fairly well educated to have learned an instrument in that time so yeah anyway so he's really well respected by the rest of the community there are about eight thousand residents everybody knows everybody around her and you know so everyone's just like oh carl lovely man so they call him papa denker so it's just this sweet little nickname papa denker we love him he's wholesome he likes jesus and he's known um to abstain from drinking or relations with women um now Oh, we've got a cat. This is why it's called True Crime with Cats. So he abstains from alcohol and relations with women. Um, and people have later speculated that he was asexual. Now, don't come for me here, but that just abstaining from sex doesn't mean you're necessarily asexual. That may be part of your religion, you know? Um, or abstaining from sex with women may be that you don't want to have sex with women. I mean, shocker. Our boy Carl may not have been straight. There are other things. Anyway, let's not worry about whatever Carl was doing. That's his business. Good for you, Carl. Um, But anyway, subsequently, he doesn't have any kids, right? He never has a wife. He never has any kids. He doesn't live with anyone. So whatever he's getting up to in his own damn apartment is his own damn business. And no one suspects a thing. No one suspects a thing. So what went wrong? (laughs) He quits his church membership in 1906. And this is where we see things, retrospectively, go a bit downhill. So everyone's like, okay, cool, this is weird. But in approximately 1909, for unknown reasons, Carl decides to start killing people. But he starts taking in these homeless people and beggars. So how's he making his money? He's selling meat. He goes to the market and he goes to the, and he's part of the butcher's guild and he sells meat. So this meat, it's in jars, it's pickled, it doesn't have any skin on it, it's also boneless. And then he's also going around selling leather goods. So he's like, hey, do you want some shoelaces? And people are like, yeah, I'd love some shoelaces, Carl. Here, have some. Give me some money. Thank you. Um, So his neighbours are like, right, Carl's a good bloke. But they get a bit suspicious because they complained of some strong smells coming from his apartment. And he always had loads of meat in a time of hardship. So they're all like, yeah, you know, it's pretty weird. Like, um, there was always, like, loads of hammering and he'd be out there with his buckets of blood in the middle of the night. But, like, he's a good guy, so maybe he's just preparing his dishes for markets. We'll just leave him to it. Now, most of his neighbours go on to say that they presumed that it was dog meat. Why? Why is that okay? I mean, I can... Okay, so it's dog meat. But then how does that explain the leather goods? I don't... So... How did he get caught? It's December the 21st, 1924, and about 1 p.m., this guy rocks up. He's called Vincent, rocks up to the police station, and he's, like, covered in blood. And he's, like, terrified, and he's like, guys, police officers, Papa Denka tried to kill me with a pickaxe. He hath yoked me in the head with a pickaxe, and I hath run away. And all the policemen are like, no, no. No, you're wrong. Can't be Papadanka because he's really wholesome. Um, and so they don't believe him. So he's like bleeding from the head. So they get this doctor in there and the doctor's just like, I mean, medical opinion, 
this guy has been hit in the head with an axe. So the police are like, oh, for goodness sake. Fine. So they call Carl in and they're like, Carl, Papadenka, our boy, sweet Papadenka, this man here is telling us that you hit him in the head with an axe. And Carl's like, well, yeah, I did hit him in the head with an axe, but only because he was trying to steal from my property. And they're all like, oh, okay. They put him in a cell and they're like, bye, Carl. See you in a little bit. And a guard goes to check on him a bit later. And they're like, knock, knock, knock. No answer. And they walk in and there is Carl and he's committed suicide. He has hanged himself with... Now, some sources say a handkerchief. I don't know the logistics of that. That's got to be like, how do you hang yourself with a handkerchief? I mean, mm. And then other sources are saying that he did it with some of his leather suspenders. Leather suspenders. But I also feel that's a bit dramatic. But anyway, Carl hath yoked himself off said mortal coil. He is no longer here. And the police are like, right, this doesn't look good, does it? He's killed himself. This looks a bit guilty. So the same night, they decide to go and look at Carl's home. And this is where it hits the fan. So this 64-year-old man, so at time of death, he was 64, has been busy. He has been up to no good. He hath been doing many things. So they get to his house and they're like walking around. <sighs> and then they're like... <laughs> Wow, this is a really overpowering smell of vinegar. Vinegar isn't illegal. I like vinegar, it's delicious. It's used in the pickling process. He was known to pickle jars of meat and sell them. But then they keep looking and they find the things they find. Oh, Carl, Carl hath been a busy boy. As if it wasn't already, it's about to get pretty graphic. I would leave if that's not your thing. Bye, yeah, love you. So everyone who's still here, we're gonna go into the findings of what was found in this absolute hell house of Carl's. So the authorities went inside and they essentially discovered what was like a meat processing shop. And then lab tests went on to confirm that sadly, all of this meat that Carl had, it was in fact human remains. So I'm just gonna read off a little list of what was found. They found jars with pickled meat. They found bones. And when I say bones, I mean so many bones. They found suspenders made out of human skin. They found a collection of about 350 human teeth. Carl the kleptomaniac, am I right? Damn, bloodstained clothes. They found axes, saws, hammers. And then they found this ledger. So a ledger is a bit like a diary. Um, and in it, he listed loads of names, like things about the victims um, and some things that they'd helped him out with, like gardening and stuff. So bizarre. Like it was, it was dated, so it goes all the way back. Um, and it was also like he had the respective weight of the bodies, which is just so grim. It's so grim. Um, but from that, authorities positively identified 20 victims with their names, which is you know, something. Um, but most of them were recently out of hospitals or prisons. So that's just so sad. Dozens of identification documents. Um, again, another way for them to identify some victims. This is the worst bit. Found three pots that contained a cream-based sauce with human meat also in it. And if that wasn't disgusting enough, they said that it appears there was one portion missing. So, congrats, Carl, you're gross. Modus operandi. So how do we think that Carl went about doing these things? So the cause of death. Now, there was only one piece of fractured skull that was ever actually discovered, but as he tried to kill his last intended victim with a pickaxe, we can probably infer um, that he had done this before. Usually serial killers stick with something if they find it works for them. So if Vincent's was the long line of almost 40 victims, we can maybe expect that he had used this method before. So forensically, the bodies can tell us a lot about what had happened, even post-mortem. Um, and some of the noted findings were liver mortis, which is where the blood settles in the time after death. 
um, indicated that the dismemberments had happened post-mortem. They'd taken place after death. Um, it also shows that there was no evidence of vital reaction, which is like when you cut yourself, you have clotting factors in your blood that try to stop the bleeding. This didn't happen. So again, that indicated that the victims were dead upon dismemberment. So, I mean, it implies that maybe the dismemberment wasn't done in a sadistic manner. It was done because he needed to do it. It's not much better, Carl. That's not good. The victim profile. We already know um, that the ledger indicated that Carl had targeted a lot of the really kind of forgotten people of society, people who'd been in and out of prison, people who had just come out of hospitals, people who were homeless, which we see a lot of serial killers do because they're less likely to get found out because people don't miss these people. If they don't have families, there's no one to say, hey, I haven't seen so-and-so in six months, which is so sad. Despite that, we had some names, but also the amount of bones in this house indicated that the ledger didn't tell all of the victims. Say we look at the teeth that were found. The dental remains of the victims tell us a great deal. He was thought to remove them post-mortem as part of his dismemberment process. Um, and there are two factors here that can indicate the age of our victims. Um, the teeth included wisdom teeth, which usually start to grow out and erupt age of about 18 to 25. So it implies that his victims were adults, not children. We also saw that some of the teeth showed signs of senile atrophy. So as you get older, your teeth get weaker, etc. So these weren't young victims. The sexes of the victims were hard to determine. There was only ever one pelvis found. And the pelvis, your hips and the area of the body, is the easiest way to determine between male and female. The size of the bones again indicated that these were fully grown adults of varying ages and strengths. Most of the bones were visibly sawed, as we know he dismembered his victim. And then the tools that were found were three axes, a pickaxe, a large wood saw, and three knives. And upon lab examination, again, they were shown to carry traces of human blood. So we may suspect that these weapons were used in the murders or after. <sighs> leather goods. I mean, we don't really know why he did this bit, to be honest. We don't know why he did most of this, but, oh, God, I suspect maybe money as he was selling them. So grim. But examination found that all of the things he'd made, suspenders, etc., were actually of really shoddy quality. I don't know why they decided to note this on the report, but the investigators did. They were like, yeah, that's really rubbish. Okay, so I'm just going to be realistic here. I'm a little bit gutted for Carl, because can you imagine, like, you go through your whole life, everyone's like, he's an idiot, and then you, like, cock up everything you do, everything you turn your hand to, and then, then you do something absolutely horrific, like, bloody killing loads of people, and you're like, wow, I'm just going to get creative with this and make some garments. And... The only thing they had to say about your crimes was, wow, that's a rubbish hem. <laughs> oh, <laughs> great, great, fantastic news. Unlucky, Carl. Okay, so elephant in the room. Who wants to talk about cannibalism? Honestly, not me. Honestly, not me. This man was a mess. Why did he do it? Not very nice. The assumption has been made on the findings that Carl was cannibalizing his victims. And although this is a logical conclusion to make, we cannot prove that he did. We didn't see him do it. He didn't confess to it. Um, although the freshly cooked meal... Ugh. Um, and then to add to this assumption, Carl had labelled the boxes in which he'd kept all these teeth as salt and pepper. Oh, God. Which is a bit of a nod towards something rather gross. Wow, that part was pretty... That was pretty deep. I'm sorry about that. That was rough. I didn't expect it to be so rough. It was rough for me. Bog off, Carl. I know that all of your farming went downhill and it was all very sad. Be a vegetarian. You could have just been out here eating some carrots. I don't know what grows 
in Prussia. But come on, Carl. Not very nice. So we've got all this evidence. But why was he doing it? What were Carl's motivations here? Now, his crimes didn't really appear to be of a sexual or sadistic nature. Um, Carl didn't seem to be doing his killings for attention like other serial killers that we've seen in the past, such as Jack the Ripper. Um, for instance, where we saw Jack the Ripper had this interesting relationship between him and the police. He wrote all these letters that started with Dear Boss um, and initially tried to write them in blood, I think, but then settled for red ink. Dramatic! Um, but yeah, so after every crime that he had, he was wanting to take responsibility for it. He wanted the media attention. Um, whereas this chap, although I'm not saying it's any better, um, buried... Oh, God, he didn't just bury the evidence, did he? Oh, no. So anyway, he, he hid the evidence. He wasn't displaying it. Um, and as soon as he got found out, he was like... It's been real, guys. <laughs> Bye! And yote himself off this mortal coil. I'm not saying that he wasn't enjoying it, because I feel like the act of creating leather goods, leather goods out of the bodies of people, I mean, I don't know how you have to be so detached to do something of that nature. Oh, in fact, any of it... I probably shouldn't spend time trying to understand um, the motivations and um, ability of people who commit horrific crimes, because I don't think I ever will, which is probably quite lit, to be fair. I'm pretty happy for me. Hi, my name's Phil. I'm not a serial killer. Not Jay. It is fascinating. It's, you know, it was one of the reasons I covered this case. I do think it's, you know, the, the reasons why people do these things is so interesting. But with this one, I think it's pretty cut and dry. Oh, faux pas. Again. So he clearly knew what he was doing was going to get him into trouble and was wrong. Um, and a lot of the evidence does indicate that he was selling these parts of the victims. He was using it as an income. So without a confession, we might conclude that it wouldn't be too crazy to think that he was doing this, although very immoral, as a way to get by. But what I find crazy is no one found out sooner. He had so many victims and a lot of his behavior was like undeniably suspicious. I mean, that the neighbors heard all these things. They never once saw any cattle, any dogs anything of that nature, and yet completely, I don't know, turned a blind eye to the fact that he was clearly up to something really dodgy. Um, so yeah, decades later, we don't hear very much about Carl, which I think in some respects is a good thing, because, God. So thank you to coming to the first episode of True Crime and Cats. Um, I hope you have a lit day. Um, and <laughs> stay safe out there. Don't trust people who pickle boneless pieces of meat. Don't do it. Don't. Come on then. <gasps> oh!